Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everyone, wherever you may be, and welcome to this seminar in the Peking University School of Transnational Law, Beijing Dashi Guoji Fashi Yuan's Law and Humanity Seminar Series, Fali Yu Wen Wen, My name is Norman Ho, and thank you all for joining. Uh, our speaker today is Professor James Penner, who serves as the Kwa Gyok Chu Professor of Property Law at the National University of Singapore. And prior to joining the faculty at the National University of Singapore, Professor Penner taught uh, at various institutions, including Brunel University, the London School of Economics, King's College London, and University College London. He works in the areas of legal theory, property theory, and also trust law, uh, and has written several uh, books, including uh, The Idea of Property in Law, is one monograph, and also Property Rights, a Reexamination. And Professor Penner will speak to us today on the topic of our duties, burdens. Uh, he will speak for approximately 40 minutes, and then we will open the floor up for questions and answers. So thank you very much, James, for being with us. Welcome, and over to you. Well, thank you so much, Norman, for the invitation, and thank you all for attending. I hope that you won't regard it as a mistake afterwards. Um, so I'm going to do the share screen thing so people can follow along on my PowerPoint slides. <clears throat> okay, so there's the topic. Um, our yep. duties burdens on two normative sensitivities. Sorry, Norman, you had a question? No, I just thumbs up that we can see the slides. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, so... I'll just say a little bit about this. I think there's um, something about the, the notion of a norm, normative sensibility. Um, this is the idea that we have a certain perspective on certain aspects of the normative domains, like the, this includes games, but in particularly the law and morality and so on. And um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the nature of what I call a sensibility. And let me just, where is, okay. So <clears throat> I want to contrast two sensibilities. Um, one which says that duties are burdens and that duties restrict our freedom and they diminish our agency, our ability to act rationally and so on. And I'm going to call this the duties of burdens view. And I'm going to oppose this to a view, which is the one I endorse, which is that duties express our freedom. They allow us to engage in with our goals because they facilitate them. Duties are a positive expression of our practical reason. I'm gonna call this um, the view that we have a positive view of duties or TVD. Um, but in order to fix ideas, I want to give two examples of normative sensibilities which are outside this particular debate, just to get a sense of the idea. And the, these two are the, uh, the notion of um, autonomy as a normative sensibility and the notion of subjective rights sensibility, which is historically trackable. Okay, come on, what do I do now? Oh, there it is. <laughs> I'm not very good <laughs> on, on technology. So here is the autonomy sensibility. So we live in a world in which we believe that we are autonomous. And just to read this statement, an autonomous life depends upon three essential conditions. One of the person, one of the context in which she finds herself, and one in respect of the way that persons stand in relation to others. The first is the capacity for autonomy in a person, person relative sense, You know whether you actually are a rational person who can make choices and so on. And the second one concerns um, an adequate range of significant life options that you can choose from. So you, in a sense, make your life yourself. And the third is independence. That is freedom from coercion and manipulation by others. And so the basic question, the autonomy question, we can ask people, what have you made of your life? And the, the first little thing here is a quote from Joseph Raz, who is a great developer of this idea. The autonomous life depends upon the general character of one's environment or culture. For those who live in an autonomy-supporting environment, 
where you have these life options and so on. There's no choice to be autonomous. There's no other way to prosper in such a society. And you will be judged by how you um, uh, get on in that type of society. And, and so in this respect, our judging others by whether what they've made of their lives is an example, as I say, of a normative sensibility, a sensibility which was not available before the modern era in which autonomy became part of um, the culture in which we live. It might still not be available to some people in modern circumstances. So I'm going to use the example of Elizabeth II, the late Queen of England. Um, so to, to oppose this through a different sensibility um, would be in non-autonomy valuing societies. And the proper question there would be something like, have you fulfilled your station in life where God placed you, where the hierarchy of the society placed you or whatever? Have you been a good, dutiful, energetic priest, peasant, a queen, right? So uh, the late Queen Elizabeth of England, I think it would be insulting, not just not apt and being insulting in a sense, say, what have you made of her life? Because she regarded her life as one of duty and fulfilling her role. Whereas for the rest of us, <laughs> we're not placed in a particular role. And so we are naturally responsive to the question, what have you made of your life? There's another sensibility I just want to mention because I'm just using these as comparators. Um, the subjective right sensibility. So roughly there's a transition that occurred around 14, 13, 1400s in the Western world in which the Latin term use, which means right, was bi bifurcated into two meanings from, you know, what is just right um, to a right, something that one has or possesses. And prior to this subjective rights sensibility, um, say at the time when Roman law was in operation during the classical period, um, if Remus trespassed on Blackacre owned by Romulus, um, Romulus could definitely say, Remus, you wronged me. But what Remus, Romulus could not say was, Remus, you violated my rights. And that would sound odd under the pre-subjective rights sensibility um, because it would be something, it would sound something like you violated my justice or you violated my rules. It wasn't relative to the individual. Um, now, this is the world we live in. We live in a subjective rights world. And so no modern person is exempt from acquiring the facility of understanding, expressing interpersonal norms in terms of subjective rights. We have to be able to say things like you violated my rights. Um, but I want to make a note here that we don't apply it to all normative domains. We don't tend to use the subjective rights discourse when we talk about games. Football players do not typically complain about the rights being violated when they're fouled. And we don't teach a game in terms of setting out people's rights. Rather, we just say what the rules are. So uh, one of the things I want to say is that there's an alternative sensibility, which we still appreciate, which is just that there are rules that you follow and they're not individualized. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Okay, so now let's get on to the main topic, the duties or burdens, sensibility. Um, I've just got a line here about I don't want to distinguish between moral and other duties. We can talk about that. I don't think the boundary is sharp. So um, uh, it's something we can discuss. What makes a particular duty a moral duty? Um, uh, anyway, I want to sort of make you get a sense of this sensibility first by just referring to examples. And my favorite example is one from Peter Burks, um, who describes an obligation or a duty. An obligation is a rope by which we are tied. Dwell on that image. Here I am with a rope around, here you, sorry, here you are, here, no, here am I with a rope around your neck. We must allow for the other end of the rope. You are holding that. I am under an obligation to you. The picture is of this rope between us and you in control. The rope is around my neck, but in your hand. Now, I want to say there are three significant features of this image, each of which is very important. Um, the first is, which is probably the most important aspect of this sensibility, an obligation makes the duty over less free. 
The rope is a constraint. The rope is a constraint. Second, the duty or is not really conceived as an agent. She's more like a beast of burden who can be pulled this way or that. So it's not, she's not governing her own action. She's being directed in her action by someone else. And then, and then there's this obvious corollary, which is the duty right holder can release the rope if they choose to unburdening the duty or of the duty. Um, so here's another way of thinking about this. This comes from Kant and his notion of an acquired right. So he says that a contractual right is a kind of possession of another's causal powers, the causality of another's choice with respect to a performance. And the object of this right, this causality or your agency is essentially normatively transferred from the obligor to the obligee. So you gain control over the duty or his, um, uh, causal powers. Uh, this is Margaret Gilbert, and she talk, talks about this in terms of ownership. Uh, to be in a position to demand something from someone is already to, in some intuitive sense, to own it. So I sort of own a piece of you, a bit like what Kant would say. Um, uh, the, linkage, the linkage can be displayed as follows. One has a right to someone's future action, already owns that action in some intuitive sense of own. And I just the last line of this quotation, if it is performed, one might say that it has finally come into the possession of the right holder in the only way it can. So it's something you possess, but your agency brings it home. But of course, I'm in control of that agency. And some of you might know about um, Peter Benson's contract theory. Um, uh, a contract is a transfer of ownership between the parties that is fully effectuated by and is completed at contract formation prior to and independently of actual performance. So again, the notion of your performance becomes someone else's. You become this mute puppet-like figure who no longer owns your performance. It belongs to your um, obligee. And of course, for Peter Benson, conceiving this way, the liability for breach of contract in which the obliger fails to perform is not like one would normally say, uh, liability for non-feasance for not doing something. It becomes liability for misfeasance because I've interfered with something that you already have, which is a right to my agency. <clears throat> um, and so it seems to me that this sensibility can be brought out with a science fiction example. Um, so imagine that you had a device that was wirely connected to my brain, um, which would actually allow you to make me carry out what I want to do, to actually force me to carry out the task, that would be a great thing because it would cut out the middleman of my possible interference by, you know, refusing to do what I was supposed to do. Uh, here's another example from private law. This is from uh, a chap named uh, Peter Baby, and his claim is essentially that most lay people believe that if they have property rights, this is the zone of complete freedom for them and to the idea of property secures in the mind of the lay person a zone of unchecked discretionary action that others, whether private citizens or government officials, may not invade. invade. And this strikes me as being another example of this sensibility in the sense that if I have property rights, you know, any obligation or constraint that diminishes my freedom um, violates the notion of property rights, the freedom they're meant to provide us. So for example, uh, <clears throat> the duty not to commit a nuisance is can only be understood as a diminishment, diminution of, of my um, property rights. Now, here's what I think is the best statement of this sensibility on its broadest conception. And I'm just going to move 
sorry, just just so I can see a bit better the quote. Um, this is from Rawls, A Theory of Justice. I remember when I first read this, I was just gobsmacked, but here it is. Now, obviously, no one can obtain everything he wants. The mere existence of others, other persons, prevents this. The absolutely best for any man is that everyone should join with him in furthering his conception of the good, whatever it turns out to be. Or failing this, that all others are required to act justly, but he is authorized to exempt himself as he pleases. And then he sort of says, since others people will never agree with this, we, you know, we go to the original position and so on, and we come up with these principles of justice. But I want to focus on the initial thought that we are individually people who want to get everything we want and the existence of other persons and the constraints that their existence imposes upon us is kind of a shame, <laughs> if I can express this in the way of a sensibility. So in the paper I write, I am at this point almost driven to invoke Jean-Paul Sartre's um, line, hell is other people. Um, this is from his play, We Clo, uh, usually translated as um, No Exit. And the sensibility here is that in one way or another, there are other people around. Damn it. <clears throat> um, but we must deal again on with our con specifics. And that's a problem. Uh, and it's a problem because all of our, all of these dealings diminish us, reduce our freedom and so on. Um, we may acknowledge that these restrictions are justified, but it's sort of too bad. We acknowledge them in the spirit of the want of a better or fault de mieux. <clears throat> and um, Kant, I, I find Kant very difficult to reconcile on these points. But anyway, Kant sort of says famously, from private right in the state of nature, there proceeds the postulate of private, a public right. When you cannot avoid living side by side with all others, you ought to leave the state of nature and get into the civil condition, right? As if, dear, oh dear, suddenly I have to, I can't avoid, you know, running into others. And so that's the basis upon which I should understand the human condition. So here's a statement of the sensibility. I've just gone through some examples and I wanted to give you some sense of <clears throat> this in terms of a statement. So I would say the DB, DB, DBV sensibility is an attitude under which under a, being under a duty is a restriction from a freedom that ideally would never be restricted at all. Duties diminish our self-understanding as agents, or duties literally take away part of such part of our agency as the performance of duty requires. Um, understood this way, duties are burdens which we would not ideally ever have. <clears throat> okay, uh, I just want to make a few clarifications here. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I want to move on to the positive view of duties. Um, First of all, I don't think that um, DBV is just about egoism, understood as the outlook of one for whom reasons for action can only ever be their own interests or desires. I think you can um, uh, be an egoist without embracing the DBV se sensibility. As an egoist, you can actually accept duties as part of relationships if they further their, your own uh, particular interests, and I think that's true, for example, about an egoist who wants to have friendships. They can accept the duties of friendship because they think it's going to serve their interests, it's going to see what they can get out of friendship. So I don't think egoism is um, is identical. Um, irksomeness, you know, just the fact that the one might not want to perform the duty. Um, this is transcends duties. It, um, it covers things that we have no duty to perform. So for example, if I want to eat off clean dishes, I have to do the washing up. I might find doing the dishes irksome. I might, doesn't matter, I might find it pleasant. But the point is that in order to, to eat off of clean dishes, I'm going to have to do the washing up. Um, some task fulfilling duties are pleasant or neutral. I'm enjoying giving this talk. Uh, I have a duty of Norman to give this talk, but I don't find that makes it irksome. Um, 
But I do, and, and of course, some duties, I should just point out that some duties are meant to be irksome, right? A duty to pay a fine for parking illegally is imposed to make you uncomfortable with parking. So we, we can engineer duties to make them positively irksome, but duties themselves are not equated with that. This is the idea is that I think irksomeness and having a duty are essentially orthogonal. Um, but I do want to say that um, they do sometimes go hand in hand. Um, for example, one is one thinks the duty is just unwarranted or pointless or stupid. If you have a, if you if you know some structure like a university structure makes you do things that you think are stupid, pointless, then you're going to resent the duty because it's been made a duty, and it's not just irksomeness; it's something about more, more, more resent, resentfulness. And I also think that you can you can genuinely be overwhelmed by duties if you take on too many duties. This is a common aspect of our too busy lives. So I'm not saying that they 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 can't travel together, but I think they are essentially orthogonal. Um, I also want to distinguish this between, in a sense, a certain kind of attitude. Um, so we have general negative duties, not to steal, kill and so on. And we have different sorts of duties, which are contractual duties, obligations of friendship that arise in our lives, not just because they're general duties. And here's the thought that I want to just mention. Um, so a person could say, while I accept that the obligations can be burdensome, meaning obligations of the second kind, positive obligations, I can, if I have the inclination and time to do so, actually count my obligations and the more I have, the more burdened I am and the less free I, I am. I do not feel the same way towards duties such as the duty not to kill. I have no interest in killing anyone. And so it's no burden on me having a duty not to do so. And I, I basically endorse this thought. But the point is that the speaker of this thought adopts the duty uh, burden view regarding obligations, but not general duties. So all this points out, as far as I'm concerned, is that a person can adopt DBV selectively, right? Doesn't apply to every normative area of discourse. And remember again, the subjective right sensibility in games, just because we have a subjective right sensibility doesn't mean we apply to every domain of normative discourse. But I also want to remember the layman's concept of property, which does apply to general duties not to harm others. This, the bad person is feels constrained by a general negative duty not to use that property in a way that um, harms others. Okay, now sunshine and light. Um, well, sunshine is a kind of light. Um, the positive view, which is one I endorse, is that rather than holding the duties diminish free freedom, duties arise from the exercise of our freedom as autonomous rational agents. Um, Christine Korsbar Korsbar Korsgaard gives a pithy sort of summary. The ethics of autonomy is the only one consistent with the metaphysics of the modern world, and the ethics of autonomy is an ethics of obligation. Obligation is what makes us human. Now, this needs some unpacking, obviously. But the basic thought underlying this sensibility, and the one which animates the philosophy of practical reason and action, is that we only exercise our free freedom by restricting our freedom through the autom autonomous choices we make. We do not covet the situation of burdens ass. Now, if you remember this classical thing, burdens ass is a donkey who's in the middle of the road, on each side of the road, there's a pile of hay which he can eat from. But because the piles of hay are equal, he never actually makes a choice to go to one pile of hay rather than the other, so he dies of starvation, right? And so, so the idea that we can never make a decision and that have that decision binding on us puts us in the position of burdens us. Okay, so... Again, this is the positive view. An autonomous person is willing freely and rationally chooses between alternative courses of action, whereas a heteronomous person acts only upon impulse or desire without deliberation. And now I want to draw upon Joseph Raz on practical reason and just ask the question, what makes something a decision? 
So Raz distinguishes between a deliberative phase where we assess the balance of reasons and then make a decision, and then the executive phase where we exact, act on the decision. And so decisions have a kind of dual aspect. One, having made the decision is a reason for action, right? The decision, you made the decision, now we act. Um, but also, it's an exclusionary reason not to reopen the decision to re-deliberate. So if you deliberate and deliberate and deliberate and you never make a decision, you're in the position of burdens us. Um, so having made the decision is normative, it's binding. And so it, it means that you are no longer free in a sense. You have made the decision and then you must act according to your decision. So the decision restricts your freedom. It's an it's a it's a it's a emendation of your freedom, but the only way you can be free is to restrict your freedom. And Raz understands this paradox. He says, paradoxically, this may seem reason sometimes requires for disregarding reasons for action. That is, re-deliberating the decision by looking it over over all the reasons again. Similarly, my claim is that freedom sometimes requires restricting freedom. For when we choose as autonomous agents, our choice must be binding on us. Otherwise, we would never act freely at all. And I would say the same analysis applies to joint dis decision making with others. Um, you can look at the philosophy of shared or joint agency, but we coordinate our behavior by making joint decisions, and those joint decisions must then restrict our freedom so we carry on with the program we have chosen to pursue. Now, notes, of course, this does not mean it's never rational to reconsider a decision. New information arises, circumstances change. We all understand that. Um, secondly, decisions giving rise to duties, for example, my agreement to meet you for dinner, duties are rarely absolute, right? So um, I should justifiably breach my duty if I fell ill and had to go to the Now, of course, the reasons underlying that duty do not change. This is the continuity thesis that's explored by all the tort lawyers around these days. I still have a reason to apologize to you and, you know, do this next best thing to meet you for dinner as soon as I can and so on and so forth. But um, uh, the point I'm making is that duties are rarely absolute. Um, so, this is one of the important points about this view, contrary to the duties as burdens view, um, about our obliges have taking away or having our agency. Um, for the autonomous person, it's a rational agency to deliberate, choose an act which allows them to themselves fulfill their obligation. It's fully a matter of their own agency when they fulfill their obligations. That's why they get credit for doing so or discredit for failing to do so. If it was really just a matter of someone else's control, then you're essentially acting as a heteronomous person. So if you feel someone else's duties as a kind of psychological compulsion, um, as opposed to a reason for you as a deliberative creature to comply with the duty, then you're not acting, you're not actually acting as a free person. Right, And to the extent that you regard these things as threats or compulsion, you are acting as a heteronymous person who doesn't get credit or do, you know, if they comply and no blame should attach if they do not. Now, of course, this takes us into a very difficult realm about the, the, the notions of excuses and so on and so forth, where someone is not really acting according to duty, but according to threat and so on and so forth. But if you, if you regard your duties as merely threats, this is one of the problems with sanction theories of duty. If you regard them as threats, then you regard them as things that do take away your agency and you act as simply a heteronymous person. Um, so the, the upshot is that under the positive view of duties, duties of a positive, not a negative valence. 
Um, there's no negative balance being under an obligation to others. As if they constrict your freedom, they are an emendation of your freedom. Um, they advance our freedom because duties are ways of having commitments. And it's one of the chief ways in which we realize values is to having commitments towards them. Um, so if having dinner with someone realizes the value of conviviality, interesting conversation and so on, or getting together like this and um, thinking about some uh, legal and philosophical ideas is a good idea. Doing this on time, coming up, showing up and getting this is a reason for me. <laughs> it's not just a reason for you as the rope around my neck suggests. I don't regard this as a normative burden. I regard it as an obligation, but I, this is not an irksome this point. I'm just saying that I regard fulfilling my duties in respect as achieving values. Um, just also, just this is a bit parenthetical, some sorts of um, values, especially, you know, values with other people, fr friendship is an example, actually consist in the duties that go with them, right? So if you're a friend with somebody, you support the friends when they're going through a rough patch, you want to celebrate your successes with them. Um, and if you're un in uninterested in assuming those duties, then it just means that you're not interested in that particular friendship and maybe you know you don't value friendship you're not interested in friendship at all but being interested in friendship is just being interested in the bonds that you form which <clears throat> involve uh duties um so on this i want to just finish with a couple of final quotations this is from john gardner and is from personal life to private law which which i sorry which i think reflect the sensibility um, so he says, it is, it is a mistake to think of our duties as burdens that get in the way of our living our lives well. Although performing duty may sometimes hold us back in some aspect of our lives by inhibiting our pursuit of a personal goal, which mo what most reliably blights our lives is not the performance of our duties, but the breach of them. I agree. Um, this is a slightly longer a uh, quotation from Christine Korsgaard, but I'm going to read it out. Um, she says, if we are to successfully address the question of the ground of moral obligation, we must ask the question in the right way. And that means we must be aware of the way in which it emerges as a problem in the context of human life. Many philosophers address the problem as if it arose in this way. People go through life doing what they please, acting on their desires, either in a spirit of wantonness or prudence, and once in a while, moral obligation strides in like a teacher striding on the playground to crush and spoil the fun. Why should we put up with it? And she goes on, but this isn't a picture of how the problem of moral obligation arises because it isn't a rec recognizable picture of human life. We do not go through our days doing what we please, following the beckoning of desire, Human life, or anyway, adult, adult human life, is pervaded through and through with obligation. It consists of doing things like doing our jobs, helping our friends, living up to our roles as teachers, citizens, neighbors, parents, and so forth, and being obligated, having to keep ourselves on the track determined by our roles and projects, in spite of temptations to laziness or selfishness or cowardice, is part of our everyday business. For human beings, obligation is as natural as desire, as desiring something we experience every morning when the alarm goes off. So far, obligation is simply a psychological reality, and as such, does not need a justification, only an explanation. And I think the justification, only an explanation part is extremely important. And so what I'm saying is that the positive view of duties seeks an explanation explanation, not a justification. We don't have to justify the fact that we create duties, comply with duties. What we have to do is explain how they form part of our human life as the creatures we have with the human nature. We have specifically the inherent normativity of the decision-making of the rational, autonomous, value-seeking agents that humans are. Now, None of this is denied that there may be grave disputes about what is a value. That's obvious. We disagree about what values we should pursue and so forth. Um, 
But the claim is rather that these disputes only make sense against an understanding of humans as necessarily valuing creatures who can pursue the realization of value rationally, alone, or with others. Um, now, I just want to return, and then I'll finish, a final point uh, about the duties as burdens view in contractualism. Uh, so here's the quote from Rawls, which I gave you before. No one can obtain everything he wants. The mere existence of other persons prevents this and so on. Um, uh, and of course, you know, the purpose of this passage for Rawls is to describe self-interested individuals who choose in Rawls' original position behind a veil of ignorance with respect to their own talents, beauty, parentage, whatever. Um, he describes these pe people as egoistic, but I think that's wrong. Uh, um, I think they understand the reality. They, they must understand the reality of other people's situations, given they have to understand that the characteristics they have might not be the ones that they will actually have. So I just don't think that self-interested here entails the kind of egoism that I've discussed before. And I also think that there's, you know, I don't, on one version, I don't agree with the idea that they have to be described as asocial, atomized individuals. Uh, I think the very fact that they engage in this exercise commits them to a kind of sociality, that they cannot live together under some arrangement. Um, and I don't think anything stops them from recognizing social relationships of friendship um, and so on. But here's the claim that I want to make. Here's the, the kicker claim. My claim is that what best characterizes the participants in the original position is just their embrace of what I've described as the duties as burdens view. Their perspective is one of a kind of wistfulness about the human condition and that living with others necessarily involves a loss of freedom rather than the gain in freedom I defended above uh, under the heading, you know, positive version of duties. Um, now, it would obviously overstate the case to say that <laughs> the people in the original position sort of think of, you know, hell as other people. But it would not overstate the case to say that in many ways, others, however much we can do with them, tax our freedom where duties being burdens are the obvious locus of that sensibility that they tax our freedom. And so here's my, my final trick. Here's Rawls' principle of the greatest equilibrium, his first setting down of this principle. Each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties compatible with the system of liberty for all. Now, I know he changed this formulation later on. I can discuss that largely under the criticism of H. Light Hart, but this is his opening view of it. Um, and I claim this perfectly reflects the outlook of the DBD, the duties as burdens view. And this can be shown by reframing the principle in terms of duties, uh, which is exactly the correlativity framing that Hofeld's system would license. So what if Rawls had written this? Each person is to have an equal right to the least restrictive total system of equal basic duties compatible with the system of duties for all. So just turn the liberties and the duties from the Hoffeldian scheme. And if that's right, my claim is, then that's exactly what the DBD says. Um, and if this is correct, Here's a larger point, one that I'd be very grateful to hear. You, would, you can all stomp on me about this, if I got this wrong. If this is correct, then to the extent that I've undermined the duties as burden view, this undermines at least a Rawlsian version of the contractualist program in moral philosophy. And thus I end. Thank you very much, James, uh, for the presentation.